that on mind, I'm really excited. Uh, we've got two real eminent speakers with us. So something different we're doing now on Healing Our Earth, we've actually got two speakers together, two real, really proud and a pleasure to introduce two real experts in their field. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them both together, Dr. Bharat Panganya and Lord Jitesh Radia. So, Gadia, sorry, Lord Jitesh Gadia. Jitesh, my apologies. <laughs> um, and um, really, you can watch the interaction between the two of them to share some ideas as well. So, well, so with that, I'd like to just introduce uh, both of them. So, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Bharat Panganya, who um, is, is a passion for mine, a public health doctor. So you think, well, what's a public health doctor? So you think of um, people going down the sea and are, are troubling and you've got these great emergency people rescuing these people from the sea and uh, that's all great. But actually you've got some wise people going back and thinking, why are these people actually falling into the sea in the first place? And that's actually what a public health doctor would see. When you see these people dying of a heart attack or COVID or whatever, but actually the real clever people will be looking back and seeing what are the themes and they're looking at the next five or 10 years ahead. So with, with that in mind, uh, Dr. Punkai, I hope I've given you uh, an appropriate introduction to, se to say that. Um, and having worked in public health myself, I'm really interested. So Dr. Punkai, just to give you a bit of his back back background, um, really advises nationally on communicable disease control um, at a national and international level, and is a senior consultant in communicable disease. Um, he has done a lot of work in looking back at uh, outbreaks such as uh, the pandemic flu, influenza, SARS, uh, Ebola, and uh, I think appears actually on national television as, uh, and commenting on national guidelines. He does some very interesting work in, in looking back, uh, a major plan of testing exercises, web-based surveillance. So do look up, even go to our website, healingourearth.com and, and do read his background as well, because it's a real pleasure, uh, Dr. Bharat, to have you uh, with us. And along with you then, we've got Lord Jidesh Gadia. Many of you know, so uh, Lord Gadia was actually on our inaugural session. Uh, we did, the whole healing earth started, as you know, with a global Gayatri Mantra. And on that day, I remember uh, we were there together actually with Lord Gadia, who shared a really inspirational speech and spoke at that time of what was happening. And that was three months ago. So it's great to have you back on. Uh, Jidesh, have you been on since, or this is your second time on? No, this is uh, my second time and I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. And I think last time you had this really inspirational Orm background and this time you've got your study behind you. So it's great. So again, those uh, not knowing Lord Gadia uh, really is uh, in the theme and in the field of finance, a real um, expert in that field is an investment banker, a businessman and a member of the House of Lords um, and really a board uh, member of UK government investments and uh, really advising the UK government on various, uh, on various aspects of finance. Uh, Lord Gadia serves on the boards of, of various companies. Please do read up his, his write-up really, and has been involved in some very prestigious companies, etc. Graduated from Cambridge University and attended the London Business School. Um, so those are sort of the backgrounds. What we envisage now, I think, with, with Dr. Pankanya and Lord Gadia is an interaction between the two of you, We've got an hour together. We've just gone past, well, it's about quarter past three UK time. We've got the next hour together. So please use your time. Let us explore together the theme of, of COVID, uh, whether it be from an economic, from a public health point of view, wherever you want to go. So I'll hand over to both of you, whoever wants to take off first, uh, and let's enjoy and learn from your expertise. Well, th thank you, uh, Milan, for those uh, kind introductions. Uh, namaste again. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this live broadcast, which I'm delighted to be co-hosting with Dr. Bharat Pankanya, who, as you heard, is a world-leading expert on infectious diseases. Some viewers may have watched a session which we recorded together in mid-March, just before the lockdown, and it's great to be reunited to provide another update on the pandemic as we emerge on the other side of lockdown. If anything, uh, we should have uh, done this sooner. So welcome, Dr. Pankanya. Namaste, namaste everyone. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. What is interesting in your um, welcome introduction, uh, Lord Gadia, is we were ahead of the curve. So when we met in March, we were ahead. We could see the rising tide of problems to come. 
and look at how our world has changed. Uh, we're going to have a conversation. And in that conversation, I hope I can link in all the journeys we've made since we met at our home in uh, March. And uh, I just feel very, I feel pained. I feel a lot of pain that considering we were well ahead of the curve in March discussing these matters at our home here in Bath, uh, things haven't gone quite as I would have liked them to go. Let's have the conversation. Indeed, and uh, I think I would uh, like to follow up uh, many of the points you made. And indeed, you know, when we recorded the earlier video, uh, you did kindly host us at your delightful home in Bath. And uh, over the course of the last few months, uh, many of the viewers uh, will have seen or heard uh, Dr. Bukanya on a regular basis on multiple TV channels and radio programs, sometimes standing in his beautiful garden and at other times from indoors like you see today with a wonderful brass statue of Nataraj in the background. Um, but by, can I, before we do move on to the substance, can I just uh, begin by commending you, not just for the sheer stamina you have shown, but also for the clarity of your public health messages and also uh, for the other selfless activities you do alongside, including distributing Gujarati vegetarian meals to those less fortunate in your local area during the weekend. Everything you are doing is a unique and genuine service to society. And I applaud you on behalf of the whole community. Thank you, thank you. Now, I didn't know that you knew that I uh, <laughs> have been cooking my Gujarati vegetarian food. Uh, there's a hidden agenda here, uh, uh, Lord Gadia. My hidden agenda is, uh, apart from the seva and I want the poor people and Bath, a affluent city has got poor people. I want the poor people to enjoy the best of Gujarati food because Gujarati food is not Indian food in restaurants. So it has really been my pleasure every weekend to cook a different <laughs> Gujarati vegetarian food and distribute it to the poor people here in Bath. It really has been a pleasure. Well, that's a, a really noble uh, mission. So when we uh, met at your home on the 15th of March, the UK had almost 1400 confirmed cases. And at that point, uh, we had recorded less than 50 deaths from COVID. In the ensuing uh, 17 weeks, we now stand at over 65,000 excess deaths, according to the Office of National Statistics. And we have registered the second highest deaths per million of population in the world. And as you said, it's a, it's a human tragedy, tragedy which has touched so many families. So I think the very first point is to express our sincere condolences to those who have lost loved ones. We know the BAME, the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Communities, including the British Indian community, has been disproportionately impacted. And we will specifically come on to that uh, important topic. And as you also said, many of the um, themes we discussed uh, in March have survived the test of time and, and we were ahead of the curve in many ways. So perhaps today we can revisit some of those issues, but also look forward to how we live with COVID for the foreseeable future. It's clear uh, that it's going to be an endurance test, a, a marathon and not a sprint. So I've identified um, nine, nine themes. Uh, so let's kick off with the first and discuss what we have learned about transmission and immunity since March, and maybe begin with the role of droplets and aerosol transmission, and what that means about being in confined and crowded spaces, and indeed the importance of ventilation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very important subject. Uh, so we've had the line that this is droplet spread. And by droplet spread, we meant uh, droplets coming out from your nose and mouth, uh, heavy droplets coming out, landing on the floor and contaminating surfaces. So the root of infection was a direct hit from myself having a conversation with you if I were infected and my droplets as a spray coming out and hitting you on the face, nose, mouth, 
and infecting you that way, or I contaminate a surface and your hands touch that surface and then you introduce your hands to your nose and mouth and get infected that way. So that has been the, uh, the common, the majority belief. Having said that, um, in my introduction, uh, I was introduced by uh, Dr. Shah as uh, somebody who does blue sky thinking. So I think the unthinkable, I think about what else, what else could be the matter? And uh, I, I, I've always been one of those awkward guys, shall we say, awkward in a nice way. I'm always thinking of what if, what if, what if, what if it goes wrong? So uh, I proposed and I said it about March when we were talking about the Diamond Princess um, um, docked in Yokohama Harbor in Japan. I said so on BBC News Channel that I think there is a additional mode of transmission going on here in this confined space. And I said, we have a issue about crowded places and a confined space and air conditioning and sewage systems. And we need to look into it. And very interestingly, uh, about five days ago, the WHO said, we think that there is a additional mode of transmission as well, an aerosol mode. We knew for a long time that the tiny droplets, which probably don't have a lot of virus in it, remain airborne for up to three hours, especially in a confined space where there's a lot of people. So I believe that in a confined environment, there may be at play three elements of virus transmission. One, the direct heavy droplets, face-to-face -face conversation. Two, the contaminated surface. And three, possibly, maybe, to some extent, an additional factor, aerosol transmission. And what I mean by that is these tiny droplets travel a lot further than the two meters safety distance that we've all got accustomed to. So where do we go from here? Well, if this is fact and it is scientifically verified, we need to take additional measures in confined places where, confi where aerosol transmission may also be at play. What are these additional measures that we can take? take? The additional measures would be limit, limit the number of people. So more people equals greater dangers. So we've had offices, workplaces, pubs, clubs, etc., all limiting the number of people. I would want to say we develop a formula for reducing that further or keeping it to a minimum. So limit number of people. Second point. You continue with all your normal hand hygiene and infection control, which is uh, two meter separation, etc. Then finally, one more, very important. You either open your windows and you have thorough ventilation from both sides. So here in my house, here in my, by the way, this is my mandir room and my study is over there. So here in my mandir room, what I would do if I was sitting here, is open the windows here, open that door here, and have a thorough flow of air. So people, please, everyone listening to me, in your homes, I've only tweeted this afternoon before coming on, that we need other attention, such as increased ventilation in the workplace and in your homes. So I think those are the measures that we should implement immediately. Uh, social distancing, hand washing every two hours and ventilation. I'll come on to the subject of masks in a later conversation, if yeah, I may. Absolutely, and uh, maybe I can sort of link into that by um, uh, just mentioning a, an emerging area of uh, research which is related to what you've uh, just described, which is sort of so-called super spreading where one person infects a disproportionate number of other people and the related issues of sort of super spreading events or, or venues ranging from 
you know, meat packing plants to choirs, dormitories, nightclubs, food markets, uh, cruise ships, I think you mentioned, and even uh, a sort of Zumba classes in places like Japan or, or South Korea. And there's an obvious link here to crowded spaces and the sort of activities that give rise to droplets and, and um, aerosol. So maybe I can use that as a, as a further link uh, into addressing uh, the use of face masks or face coverings. Um, and where there has been now uh, more evidence, and, and I think even you've said that you have changed your stance on this, um, it would be great if we could sort of summarize what you think are the current benefits, when to use them, what types of mask or face covering to use, and how to use them. So thank you. So yes, leading neatly on to face coverings uh, or, or face masks. So what is the purpose of these things? Um, we want to catch the droplets. So if I were infectious, I want to release as few a number of droplets as is possible. So that's the purpose of wearing a mask. That infectious person, and we will talk about symptomatic and asymptomatic infectious persons later. So bank that for a moment, please. Um, so I, the infectious person, will be releasing lots and lots of uh, viruses through my nose, through my mouth. And the more I speak, the louder I speak, the singing, the choir, all those places, um, loud place. So you have to raise your voice to be heard. All those areas release more droplets. So what we want to do is have a face covering and with a face covering, you are limiting the number of droplets coming out. It's not fail safe. It is not a absolute protection. It is a relative protection. And the relative protection is you're reducing the number of droplets uh, coming out of an infectious mouth. And the idea is this, I wear a mask, you wear a mask. I don't infect you, you don't infect me. And that's what we should do. So finally, where should we be wearing our masks? Well, if you understand the science, the biology of this virus, it is humans that infect you. So if you are out for a long walk in the countryside, in the park, away from other human beings, no need. No need whatsoever to wear a mask. Why would you? No humans near you. On the other hand, if you are on a crowded train, a bus, a crowded supermarket, mingling with other people in close proximity over a prolonged period of time, I would wear a mask. And remember, the mask is not 100% protection. It is just reducing it a little bit. How much it reduces by, we don't know. Nobody's done these studies. So empirically speaking, common sense tells us, and the Japanese, the South Korean, and the Chinese experience tells us that wearing a mask reduces the level of virus, reduces the chances of getting infected. It's not absolute reduction. And we do it in crowded places. That's very clear. And uh, particularly, I think the, the emphasis on, you know, I. I, I protect uh, you, uh, you protect me, which I think is a very important principle of uh, reciprocity. Um, I just wanted to, on, on face masks, cover a, one or two other dimensions, because I think, uh, you know, given the, the likelihood, and I hope this happens, that we you know, make it much clearer that um, face masks or covering should be used in other places like uh, shops, which obviously is very much in the news uh, today. Um, what types of mask um, should people use? And I, I think, um, and you've commented on this publicly, I think that there is a, a point here that we should probably uh, just point out to people that don't use um, uh, ones that have valves, and, and if you could explain that. And of course, for you know, you 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 wear a very elegant pair of <laughs> spectacles, uh, but obviously there is for those who wear glasses uh, the issue of uh, misting up. And if there are any tips you could provide just to uh, uh, alleviate that. Uh, 
Lord Gedia, I'm very impressed that you you know a lot of my public announcements that I have made. I'm very impressed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for following uh, what I have been saying in public. I'm very impressed. Well, so, I follow you on Twitter. So I, I, I uh, and actually, I think at the end, we will just remind you of what your Twitter handle is, because I would definitely urge everybody to add you, uh, because it's always very informative. Thank you. Thank you. So with regard to masks, we don't want to wear surgical quality masks. We must not wear clinical masks at all. Um, you wear a covering and the best coverings are if you're going to make it. And a lot of our people are very good at sewing and stitching. So please use your artistic license to make beautiful, colorful, interesting, picturesque masks. Let us showcase to the world the talent we have in our community. Go for it. So what would you use as a fabric? On the outside, you want it to be a tight weave, water repellent type fabric. On the inside, so it's usually three layers we want. On the, on the very inside layer, you want it to be absorbent. So it is absorbing um, the secretions from your mouth. It's going to get stale, it's going to get smelly, etc. So you don't want it so absorbent that you cannot reuse it by washing it. So not too absorbent, but as absorbent as you can get away with regular washing. And then a, also a middle layer, which would be uh, an absorbent layer. So three layers, uh, make it nice and colorful on the outside and it covers your nose and mouth area, just this area here. That is all you are after. Second point, this thing, this thing of the, the mask and the warm air coming up and hitting your glasses and misting up. Headache, headache, absolute headache. So when I did surgery, that was really a, a headache. So what we did then was work out a system and it is individual. So what we did was hold the mask there and then put a bit of sellotape there to stop the hot air from your breath going up and misting your glasses and it goes down and out or out over the sides. So that's the procedure I would use. I know it is not a perfect solution, but you're not wearing a mask all the time. You're only wearing it in crowded places. So a bit of sellotape may help. I think those are great uh, tips. And I think as we increase the prevalence of uh, um, wearing of face masks, I think those will be really valuable. Now you mentioned asymptomatic uh, transition, there's transmission, there's more research uh, coming out on that. It seems that you know, anything between 40 to 80% of infections occur from individuals without symptoms. Can you just um, summarize for us what, what we now know about this and what, what the implications are? Yes, thank you. So um, our viewers, our listeners may be aware that in 2002-2003, a new virus emerged and we called it the SARS virus, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It is part of the coronavirus family and the SARS-CoV-2 that we are dealing with today is related to the SARS that arrived in 2002-2003. The reason why I'm dwelling on this is as follows. When you got the infection with the SARS virus, 2002-2003 version, you became infected and symptomatic. In other words, you showed signs and symptoms of illness, high temperature, unwell, short of breath, clearly, clearly ill. And at that point when you became ill, you were also infectious. So illness and infectiousness came at the same time. So as soon as we knew somebody had a temperature and they were ill, we were able to pull them out of circulation and pull all their contacts out of circulation. So that was luck on our side. We were able to identify the cases, pull them out, identify their contacts by contact tracing, pull them out. And that public health action plus a bit of good luck 
helped us eliminate SARS from planet Earth. Now, coming on to the coronavirus COVID-2 that we're dealing with today, unfortunately, it is smarter, the, the GTI version or the souped up uh, version of this virus is a lot smarter. And the smartness is people are without symptom infectious. So you could be perfectly normal, like me, like you, like others, perfectly normal. 80%, up to 80% of the people are perfectly normal, but they are throwing out these viruses through their mouth and nose. So they are infectious without symptoms. This is very serious because therefore you, the, the, the mental picture in people's mind is, I am okay. I can't possibly be infectious, therefore, What's the big deal about infection control measures? What's the big deal about being close to you? What's the big deal about shaking hands and so on? So you can be without symptoms, infectious, makes control very difficult. So we need to treat, and I made a headlines on this line. Again, um, March the 7th, we were ahead of the curve. March the 7th, in the Sun newspaper of all the papers, I said, Treat everything and everyone as infectious. If you treat everyone and everything as infectious, irrespective of any signs and symptoms, you will be in a better place. Uh, so my advice of 7th of March still stands. Everyone and everything, every place, treat as infectious. These are people without symptoms, but are infectious. I hope that answered your question, Lord. Gaines. Yeah, very, very much. And look, I think that important principle also has knock-on impacts on on other areas, and we'll come on to the whole issue of uh, testing and, and tracing la later on. But obviously, it's this is a fundamental issue um, affecting that. If we could maybe round off the, this first point, first area of of uh, discussion around just uh, immunity. Who has it and how long does it last? We've um, had more seroprevalence surveys released. which estimate the number of uh, people within a country who have been infected with COVID by testing for antibodies. And the interesting thing is that apart from big cities like London or New York, where you know anything up to 20% may have been infected, it seems like most countries, and I saw a survey uh, released um, from Spain uh, recently, the most countries taken as a whole don't have infection rates of much more than 5%, which means that the vast majority of the population uh, is still vulnerable. And I assume we will really only know more about how long immunity lasts with the passage of time, given the sort of recency of this virus. But um, some of the Chinese studies from Wuhan seem to show that it could fade um, quite quickly. However, um, and this is where I want to sort of bring you in, we, we do have um, some more encouraging um, evidence around T cell response or cellular immunity. And look, we have viewers with a wide spectrum of different scientific understandings. So maybe but by you can uh, explain this in in lay ter layperson's terms. Um, uh, what what do we know about immunity, and what are the the the, the, the at least the encouraging signs that uh, are emerging from this? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is some positive news that we have, uh, and I'm going to take you through the journey. It's a lovely journey. The common cold virus is part of the corona fa coronavirus family. So we have MERS in the Middle East, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. We had SARS, and then we've got SARS-CoV, and we've got the common cold virus, all brothers and sisters, one family, okay? And, the, and you all know that you often get a cold about every six months. So the implication there is that when you've got your cold, you don't make long lasting immunity. So you catch it every six months and hence your common cold recurs. That is because the coronavirus, for whatever reason, doesn't induce memory. 
So it doesn't induce immune memory to make the body recognize it when it appears a second time. So the idea of uh, recognizing a second time is immunity. So your B cells, uh, these are the ones, your B cell chain, these are the ones that recognize you. They make memory. They recognize you and then they say, I've seen you before. And then they make antibodies against you and attack you uh, as quickly as possible. So, so, so your B cell memory cells are your uh, watch, you know, your, your guards. They, they, they see, they spot you and then they raise the alarm and then they make antibodies and the antibodies come and neutralize you and eliminate you, job done. And coronavirus doesn't seem to make immune memory with the beta cells, the beta white blood cells. Now the good news bit, okay? The good news bit is we have found that it makes uh, cellular immunity. So that's really good. So it down the T cell line, it makes cellular immunity. So why aren't we out celebrating now? The reason why we're not out celebrating is that the T cell response is a bit sluggish. So the virus arrives, it starts doing its destructive work on you, etc. Then the T cells are activated and then they come and they tackle the virus. But T cell, um, the war with T cells is sluggish. It's slow, it's not instantaneous and it's not immediate. So the T cell line of defense is sluggish is the best description I can give you. But the good news is that in view of the fact that we are making T cell memory, could it be that when you have a second infection that your chances of not having a severe infection are better, are improved? Time will tell. So there's good news and we hope that it prevents you from getting a severe infection a second time. Time will tell. Now, I'm not going to go on to the vaccines bit just yet, because I want to keep your interest. Uh, we will talk about the vaccines and immunity and B cells and T cells soon. Absolutely, we will most certainly come on to uh, uh, you know, vaccines and the therapeutic area as well. It's one of the, the nine themes. So second, um, and before we sort of look more forward, I just wanted to turn, and I think we could not not turn to care homes. There have been uh, more than 20,000 deaths in these settings. It's a real, I think, stain on all of us. Um, Dr. Bankanya, what went wrong and what lessons can we learn? Yes, thank you. Um, this is very sad. I, I feel very sad about it. And you will notice by my Nataraj and my Buddha, uh, when I do these media interviews, I symbolically light a candle. You, the camera may not pick it up, but I write that I light that symbolic candle in sympathy, in pain, in remorse, in shame that the United Kingdom the country that we are, a clever country, clever scientists, we made a mistake. It's a terrible mistake that we made. So there was a pressure. There was that panic, you could say. In Gujarati, we would say, Sukarsu. Right, we've got a problem here. So the panic was, we've got all these cases rising, we need hospital beds. So we, and I mean, Labour governments and Conservative governments over the last 20 years have systematically reduced bed numbers per population, per head of population. So for a rich, affluent country, we have reduced bed numbers by a huge margin. We are acting as if we are a poor nation with regards to bed capacity. What to do? What to do? Pandemic has arrived bed capacity, nothing. So we remove, we thought we'll send all these old people home. We will send them home under a bit of duress to the, to the nursing homes and the residential homes that you will take these people. So that decision was made and these people 
were taken from the hospital to the nursing home, the residential homes. And there was a failing. The failing was, it is a failing. Don't let anyone tell you, but side, I didn't know, I didn't know. It's a failing. Admit it, repent, and move on. Uh, so the failing was, when you move a potentially infected older person to the nursing home, the nursing home is not a clinical setting. The nursing home is uh, managed by people, many on um, minimum wage. They work in many homes to make ends meet and that sort of scenario. Nursing homes are not, despite the pay that you pay them to keep your elderly parents there, they're not run as well as they can be. Uh, and many of them are not even financially viable. So it's not like they're raking in the money. It's just the way it is. So people got into the nursing homes, they passed the infection from person to person, and a lot of people, a staggering number, over 20,000 in the UK died in nursing homes as a result of a basic error. The basic error was we introduced a infectious agent into a vulnerable environment. And then in that vulnerable environment, the infection spread like wildfire. And that's the result. Um, we should look into this. We should never make this mistake again. It's very sad. Look, I think we're totally agreed on this point. Um, I think, you know, if there is gonna be any silver lining out of this human tragedy, I think deep reform of our social care sector should definitely be very much high up uh, on the list. Um, so look, let's look forward um, uh, a little bit. So that my third topic is really, um, you know, learning to live with uh, COVID. And I've already mentioned that the you know, battle against this disease is an endurance test uh, for all of us. Uh, with new cases uh, rising globally, there's a continued need for vigilance and not letting our guard down. And I wanted to, uh, sort of explore how we, you know, how we do that and live with COVID. So Bharatba, I know you have been uh, concerned around the risks of uh, reopening prematurely given the current level and rate of infections. And to remind our viewers, uh, it's currently uh, estimated to average 14,000 uh, people within the community in England alone, according to latest uh, Office for National Statistics numbers. Uh, and whilst that number has been falling and is on average one in uh, 3,900 individuals, it's still significant if you compare, for example, to Scotland, which yesterday reported seven new cases and zero deaths. Um, whilst you can't uh, eradicate COVID completely, you can try to eliminate it. So what, what, what are the lessons, particularly from Scotland? Yeah, that's a, a lovely question. And uh, this is a very important question. Um, I hope our, our listeners are going to pay attention to this because this is, as my introduction said, forward thinking, going forward, planning, and what do we do about this matter? So let me start. Um, I said at the beginning, when this started to happen to the media, and remember, I've got two minutes in which to get my message across. So for me to slip it in is a monumental achievement. And it's not always that I managed to slip it in. So this is what I wish to slip in. And I have slipped in when um, good people, uh, BBC Radio 4 is very good, very good. They're sharp presenters. I salute them. I really do. They are the best. So BBC Radio 4, thank you. She gave me a little opening and I went for it. If you do not look after your country and the poor country at the same time, it will come to bite you. That's the shortest message I can give you. So with regards to the virus and the virus in presence around the world, we've got to eradicate and eliminate it. And we do that in our country, and we do that in the poorer country at the same time. Because if you do not eradicate it in Kenya, in Africa, 
in Brazil, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, poorer countries. What is fermenting over there, amplifying by a number of people because they are populous countries, then what happens there comes to bite you here. That is the problem. So if you look at the New Zealand model, it is fantastic. Please go and look at the New Zealand model. They did something that we need to salute them and their premier. She has done a marvelous job of saying, we are going to adopt a elimination strategy. So they were hard and fast on testing, contact tracing and border control. And as a result, New Zealand has had very few deaths. And once Australia, which is also following a similar model, think about it, Australia and New Zealand can be one bubble. United Kingdom is an island. We can also control our borders. And as a result of controlling our borders strictly and setting aside political economic considerations by inventing inventing bridges ain't gonna work. You should be as strict as you wish to be, as you can be. And if you are really strict, you can eliminate it. The political will has to be there. So you, you, you do extensive testing, extensive contact tracing and secure your borders so that you control it in your country. So my final line on this, particular subject is, I'm saying it and I'm saying it here first, hear me out. This virus to all intents and purposes is going to become endemic. And what I mean by that is it's going to be here for a long time. It's going to be part and parcel of something we have to live with. Uh, we will have to live with it. It's going to become endemic. And as a result of it becoming endemic, uh, we will just have to be careful. We will have to hope and pray. We will talk about vaccines and medications later, but we are going to have to change the way we live. Maybe on this particular platform here today, it's a good thing in that we will heal the world. So there's a lot of healing to do. Maybe we will heal because of the coronavirus. Watch this step. So look, that's a, a brilliant segue uh, into the, the next and this fourth area I wanted to address, which is how do we control the, the virus going forward, you know, almost with or without, but hopefully with an elimination uh, strategy. Uh, and central um, to this is making the testing and contact tracing system effective. It's clear that it's still a, a work in uh, progress. And I wanted to sort of put three points um, to you, uh, linking some of our earlier conversations. So the testing aspect, given the asymptomatic incidents that you referred to earlier, it seems that we, we have to, we're compelled to do more randomized testing. Otherwise, we won't know who is uh, impacted and where those people are. For contact tracing, this capability needs to be more, I would say, localized. And I would like to, to turn to the question of Leicester in a moment, but um, certainly at the moment, we don't also have uh, an app um, which creates a gap in the coverage. And the third point is clearly we need public cooperation and trust if we are going to get people to take the measures necessary, particularly to self uh, isolate. Um, have I summed it up uh, in the right way? And, and wh where where do you where would you add and amplify those points? Yes. So um, recently, on one of the media outlets, uh, I could see the presenter saying, "This Pankhanyak Saib is always moaning." He said, "How many more tests do you want?" <laughs> And I said, listen, we are testing. Numbers are large, but they're not large enough. Let me expand. Uh, Lord Gadia has uh, touched on it beautifully, really. He's said it absolutely right. He's on the ball. 
years, honestly. So what I'm getting at is we have selective testing. You order a test, it comes in the post, and we don't know. We don't know how good are our home tests. No idea. So uh, people you know, do a swab. Do you think they're going to do it properly? I don't think so. It's a very uncomfortable thing to do at home. You know, Shove it all the way to the back of your nose. Uh, uh, it ain't working. So then the other one is you go to a place, usually out of town, you drive to it and you get your swab test done that way. Now, all those are a selective population. What Lord Gadia was absolutely right in referring to is we need to have localized testing, locally delivered, locally accessible. And when you have your GP practices that we all know where our GPs are and you could have them testing it, or you could have dedicated staff stationed at your GP practice, uh, set up a little booth and have your tests there. And also in shopping centers and places like that, there you are picking up the true signals. So you test, you test randomly, you test extensively, you test all the population, not only the population who can drive and get tested. I hope I've made my point clear. So having done that random extensive testing locally with local results immediately, you identify the positives. And having identified the positives, you say to them, sir, out, 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 get out of circulation immediately. And then we uh, open up the contact tracing branch and we say all the contacts of that case, out, 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 get out of circulation. And the, um, this sounds like a complicated thing to do. Believe me, it isn't. I'm a master of contact tracing. When I say I, I did all of this, but I, when I say I, I also mean my GP colleagues, my genital urinary medicine colleagues, my public health medicine colleague, my public health colleagues, my environmental health officers. We are all local experts. We do contact tracing every day. Why are you not using us? Why, on the other hand, have you got somebody following an algorithm to follow steps of contact tracing, paying them 10 quid an hour? They are not as good as I am, my colleagues, me and my colleagues. So we should do contact tracing locally by locally run experts. We can supervise the, um, um, the people that we employ. And if you think this is too difficult, I don't think so. Because when we had the pandemic swine flu outbreak, 2008-ish period, uh, yeah, we did exactly this locally. So it was the Health Protection Agency then, and we tested extensively with sending of swabs. We processed the results and got them the next day, and we contact traced from home, uh, from the local area. So it can be done. Uh, we'll talk about Leicester in a minute. I've got some interesting things to share with you about Leicester. Well, actually, why don't we we go to that? And um, as we know, uh, it uh, is a city which has recorded the highest levels of uh, infection in the UK. And certainly, as we all know, uh, because we all have links into it one way or the other, it's a big South Asian community around half the, the population. And in the northeast quadrant of Leicester, which has the highest concentrations of South Asian probably in the whole of the UK, we know that's the epicenter uh, of the outbreak. Um, what are your reflect re reflections on the sort of this whole issue of local data, the infrastructure and the empowerment? Because look, you know, as we saw in today's uh, uh, Sunday Observer, there's another 20 locations which are on the list for potential lockdown. So we really have to learn the lessons of Leicester so that um, we can address those in, in other places as required. So uh, this is a fundamental of outbreak control and management. I would teach my children, my students, and it is lecture number one, really. So the fundamental is, if you know, you act fast. If you don't know, you don't know then you act late. If you act late, you have an outbreak, you end up with a lockdown of the whole city. So with Leicester going into lockdown equals 
failure. You failed, zero out of 10. Let me expand on this a little bit more. So if you are testing locally, you will know the rising tide of cases coming your way. And you will also know that it is sector A, sector B, sector C. It's factory A, factory B, but school A, whatever. But if you are testing locally with local demography, in other words, you do simple, easy things like capture the person's postcode, for goodness sake. So the central testing has not been capturing the postcode of the tests. And it is a selective number of tests, as we've alluded to before. So you need to have testing and you need to have the results locally. Of course, you share them with the government nationally, but the results should be available to the local outbreak managers, the incident commanders locally, as well as centrally at the same time. But you need to have the data locally in a timely manner. So for you, the mayor of Leicester to say, I didn't know I had a problem until tier two, pillar two, data results were given to me centrally is a failing. We should not be in a position where you get a phone call from headquarters in London telling you you've got too many cases. You should know about your cases. You should know the nature of the cases and stamp it out. So the analogy is you have a forest, it's dry, it is prone to fires and you need your surveillance systems, your spotter, to identify where the hotspots are occurring. So be it in North Abington, uh, Melbourne Road, uh, Spinney Hill Park, all those areas of Leicester where you're getting hotspots. You go to the hotspots, so you will already know the values, the behaviors, the nature of what may be going on in that hotspot, and you stop it. And if you stop it, you won't have to shut down the whole city. So early action, early timely action, early intelligence locally allows early local actions. And then you don't have to have a lockdown. That's very powerful, um, right by. Uh, I wanted to next move on, which is in some ways related, but uh, in some ways much broader, which is the impact of COVID uh, on the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities in the UK. Um, we first really got the real data on this from the number of people going into uh, ICU, although actually for those who had sort of had their antennae uh, up and open, uh, it was visible uh, even earlier on. And, and you know, I remember uh, noting this um, uh, when uh, you know the, the, one of the first major nationwide alerts was at Norfolk Park Hospital in um, Harrow, which is located in the heart of a large Asian community in northwest London. And um, if you look at the COVID deaths by ethnicity, and you know you will have poured over them, it's really quite a, a stark picture. So for South Asians something between two and a half to three and a half times more likely to die from uh, COVID with the highest risk category being uh, Bangladeshi and, and Pakistani uh, men. And, you know, you can, you know, there are some known factors and, and I'm sure you'll go into that, but, you know, we, we know that there are at least three factors. One is the comorbidities, so things like diabetes and heart disease. Um, there's the social and cultural factors, particularly the high number of multi-generational households. And then there are, if you like, the socio-demographic, the types of occupations held by Asians make themselves more vulnerable. Uh, you know, 30% of medical staff are, are, um, are Asian and 44% of NHS staff are BME. So uh, that gives you, you know, a clear um, explanatory factor. But even if you seem to uh, remove all of these explanatory factors, there's still an unexplained difference. Um, and so it would be really interesting to get your take on this, whether there is any genetic factor, and indeed then linking that 
to, you know, back to some of our homes in, you know, South Asia or for people in Africa or the Caribbean, um, there doesn't seem to be as much incidence at the moment. And I would stress at the moment there. So how do you sort of put this conundrum and pattern together? Yes, thank you. It's such a delicate and uh, important topic. And what it is highlighting is poverty kills. So we have known for a long time that poverty kills. And we have our Black Asian ethnic minority groups. And uh, a lot of them, we have very, very successful BAME people as well. But we also have a lot of them in poverty. And when you have crowded homes, when you have poor accommodation, when you have uh, multi-generational uh, dwellings together, there's nothing wrong with it, absolutely nothing wrong. Live with your mom and dad and your grandparents. I would advocate it. It is a good thing to do. Don't give it up. It's just a reflection of poverty, okay? So we, poor people also have poor jobs. So the poor person living in a poor household multi-generational household uh, will also be the bus driver. They will also be frontline in a healthcare setting, uh, the cleaner, the washer, the taxi driver, uh, the restaurant person, the restaurant waiter. And they have a greater chance of getting hit by a infectious person or they're, you know, it's a bit like Russian roulette. If you carry on playing Russian roulette, eventually there will be a live bullet in the in the spin of the, the revolver. So it's similar to that, repeated exposures and one of those exposure eventually finds you. There's one or two items here, which I'm pretty sure about. So I'd like to stamp on that. I think there isn't a genetic component to this. I feel we shouldn't go into this genetic area because there are nefarious people out there who wish to make us separate from other fellow human beings when we are not. We are all fellow human beings, all of us, all races, all cultures. And I don't think there is a genetic component. But what I am interested in, and I haven't got an answer, we haven't got an answer, is could there be um, deficiencies of certain uh, things like vitamin D? My answer is, I don't know we don't know. Um, could there be other deficiencies? We don't know. I don't know. What we do know is we do have a lot of diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and all of those add to our burdens of being severely ill were we to get infected. We are prone to diabetes and we are prone to heart disease and blood pressure, especially Africans. Africans have a huge propensity to high blood pressure. And so all of those people plus poverty makes them into the vulnerable group. So what I have advised, what I am advocating is we know what we know. We can't just sit here and say, we don't know everything, therefore we can't do everything. My advice is in view of the fact that we know these people are vulnerable, where you can, please make other arrangements for them. So remove them from frontline patient facing uh, consultations in a hospital setting, for example. If you are a bus driver, give him, her extra protection with maybe better masks, better PPE, and maybe a less crowded bus. So do something for these people who are driving your buses and uh, running your hospitals, and our frontline and are at risk. So you can do a risk assessment for all people, not only BAME, all people. And if you identify that they are at higher risk, do something about it. I hope that answers your question. It, it does. And I think you make a very important point that um, there's a limit on how continually we can uh, dig into the explanatory factors. And I think we have probably identified at least the contours of most of them already. Uh, and some of them, frankly, we already uh, knew about because there were existing healthcare inequalities or other inequalities that existed. 
And actually now is time for action. And we do need to take those precautionary measures, as you say, whether it's vitamin D or additional PPE or other risk-based um, steps to reduce the exposure of these communities. So thank you for uh, highlighting that. I wanted to move on to um, uh, remaining on the sort of theme of, of community, some communi community specific issues. Um, and in particular, things like family gatherings, weddings, where they have been uh, permitted to be resumed, but with no more than 30 people allowed. And then also cultural and religious festivals, obviously uh, places of worship have now been permitted, obviously under certain guidance to be uh, reopened. We have uh, Raksha Bandhan coming up on the 3rd of August and Janmashtami on the 11th and 12th of August. Um, I know you've been very helpful and our you know, interview in, in March had some of these points, but could you just reiterate for us and give us your advice, particularly with these festivals coming up, what actions, precautions we should take? Yes, thank you. So this is easy, really. It's my bread and butter. And the easy bit is know the biology and the science of infection. So coronavirus spreads by droplets and contaminated surfaces and maybe an aerosol element as well. Learn that, remember that, act on it. You've got the solution. So think for yourselves and you now know droplets, dirty surfaces, introducing it to your nose and mouth, and in a crowded place, aerosol spread as well. So what you would do is you say to yourself, I look after you, you look after me, we look after everyone. So you're going to have your gatherings, good, have them, be careful. If you can have them outdoors in the summer months, better. If you can have them in a more open space, better. If you can have them in a hall and you tell the people, Sukari, it's gonna be a little bit cold. We've got to have the windows open, checks and balances. So we've got to have the windows open. We're going to have good thorough ventilation. We're going to even have machinery to have a good flow of air and let us remain safe due, during this auspicious gathering. Of course, wear your masks as well and wash your hands. Now, with regards to wash your hands, you timetable it. So you say uh, every two hours, you're going to wash your hands. And that is a good thing to do. Wash and dry, it's not only wash your hands. And when you just cannot wash your hands, you can use the alcohol gel on otherwise clean hands. So basically the answers are, you already know them. Uh, you stay away from humans as much as you can and you remain clean. If you cannot remain away from uh, humans uh, at gatherings, for example, uh, gymnastomy coming up, you all want to go to uh, the Krishna Mandir, then you have to understand that numbers into the dwelling will be limited. One of my colleagues' fathers died at the Krishna Mandir, having caught coronavirus disease, infection and then disease, and he died. So this isn't a joke. This is serious. Few numbers, Good ventilation, good hygiene, and we hope for the best. Indeed, and, and frankly, I think I would say that um, a lot of uh, the community organizations, the temples, the uh, Gurudwaras, Derasas, et cetera, using um, Zoom and, and sort of webinars, and, and I would frankly continue to encourage them to as much as possible use those mediums as well, because I think large gatherings, as we've heard, is uh, not actually uh, a good idea. They can be super spreading events. So we haven't got that much time left. I'm sure that uh, with the help of the organizers, we will have a little bit more than, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be able to extend. Uh, Don't until, worry, uh, Jitesh, Lord Gajra, yes. it, it, we're really enjoying it. Please do carry on at the moment. Okay, well, we'll, we'll try and wrap it up by 4.30 because yeah, I wouldn't sure, want yeah. to stand up my, uh, my, my noble friend, Lord Ranger. So um, 
Sure. What we'll do okay. is we will speed it up, but there are four other topics I, I wanted to uh, quickly please cover. Do, please do carry on. Maybe you could just at least just bullet point the, 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 the themes coming up, but the things coming through on social media, on WhatsApp, everyone is really enjoying this session and is crediting both of you uh, for the clarity of questioning and the clarity of answering. So please do continue. We'll, 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 we'll try and, and, and stick to that. So the next question was really around uh, air travel. We did cover this partly with the speaker before and, and the whole question of holidays and, and quarantine, particularly as a lot of people you know, will be contemplating what they do in July and August. Some will have canceled their plans. Uh, others may not have been able to receive a refund. Um, and some might just be tempted to have a change of scene, but are hesitating about, um, you know, flying away. Um, what's your honest view on this, uh, Dr. Pankanya? Simple, uh, very simple. So, <clears throat> Uh, you know a lot about what I do. Maybe you don't know a lot about my uh, my inner soul that drives me. And my inner soul that drives me is peace and tranquility on planet Earth. And uh, we have uh, trashed planet Earth. So please, if you can, reduce your carbon footprint. Do your seva to planet Earth. Don't fly. Give it a break. And it will protect planet Earth. It will protect you. And give it a go. You know, the United Kingdom is a beautiful country. For 2020, give it a miss. Don't fly. Well, look, I whole, whole, wholeheartedly agree with you on that. I think this, if there was ever to be a year for staycations, this is it. Um, I've also cancelled my own uh, plans. I think uh, others, I think I read today in today's papers that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are also doing staycations. So, I think that is uh, the way to go. Um, next, um, I wanted to ask you uh, a very direct question. Um, is a second wave inevitable and just a matter of time or can we prevent it? Yes, thank you. And I will be fast with all my answers. So I don't want anyone to think of these as waves. I don't want you to think of the Spanish, 19, Spanish flu 1918 pandemic. This is slightly different. So there are no waves. This is a continuation of the wave. The wave has gone up and has gone down because we went into lockdown. And when we start mingling and we are starting to mingle in the summer months, uh, I don't expect the case numbers to shoot up uh, because we will be doing outdoor activities. Outdoor activities, the beach, the park, the picnics, the cycling, the river parks, etc., are low risk activities. But I am concerned. I'm concerned about autumn. So, autumn, September, October, November time when schools open, etc., I am very concerned at that time. One piece of advice which I may give at this point in time, please, to everyone, whether you need it or not get your influenza vaccine in September. All of you, everyone. It's only 10 pounds if you're not entitled to it. Do it, it's good for you. I'm pleased you make that, made that latter point. Um, and in fact, I was gonna raise it with you if, if you hadn't. And indeed, I very much hope that there will be some uh, further announcements um, by the Department of Health and Social Care, by the NHS uh, on this topic, I think clearly uh, if there was ever a year where uh, everyone should take their flu jab, this is most certainly uh, it. And um, we don't fully understand what the interaction is of flu and coronavirus. There's been some uh, research which I've read into that as to whether or not it sort of amplifies each other. But, um, it, you know, just the thought of it doesn't sound uh, very, very... Um, helpful or encouraging. So I think um, that's a, a very important uh, nudge, which I hope we will get more of and more news about uh, as we go into late summer and early autumn. So the next area, and we, we trailed this before, is around therapeutics and uh, vaccines. So on therapeutics, uh, we made some encouraging progress uh, and validated through clinical trials uh, the use of uh, drugs like uh, dexamethasone, a steroid which uh, 
uh, cuts the risk of death for those on, on ventilators by a third. Um, whilst I think some others like um, uh, remdesivir, which is an antiretroviral, are probably a little bit more disappointing, especially given the high cost. Um, what are your uh, current views on the available therapeutics? And are there, are there other promising drugs on the horizon for treatment? So thank you. So Ram, uh, let's deal with dexamethasone first. Uh, with respect to dexamethasone, uh, as you said, it saves some lives, some small number, those people who are severely ill, needing oxygen support or ventilatory support. So it's some lives. With respect to remdesivir, a lot of you clever people out there, go and read the proper research on remdesivir and dig around a little bit, dig around, do a little bit of work. I think remdesivir is not good and it has found its way and the United States and the White House has bought up supplies. There's something not right there. Uh, I'm not convinced about remdesivir. End of story. There are no other drugs on the market that we know are of therapeutic benefit. Please do not go around using your as a thiopurine, uh, azithromycin, sorry, not as a type, azithromycin, that's the antifungal drug, or your hydroxychloroquine, your antimalarial drug. No evidence. So we have, unfortunately, at the moment, no drugs. Dexamethasone is of some benefit. I'm not convinced about remdesivir and how it found its way into being used by the United States care of the White House. That's very clear. So um, if we could maybe turn to the prospects and timing for a vaccine. I think there are something like 200 different vaccine initiatives uh, underway around the world uh, with a dozen or so uh, in human uh, clinical trials. And um, what um, would be maybe quite interesting is to get your perspective on it. And particularly um, from what I understand, um, there's quite a possibility that if, you know, if and when we do uh, produce, have a vaccine uh, and it takes time to do these, you know, the earliest I've seen it heard from credible sources is for the second half of, of next year, even then it will be sterilizing immunity. It won't be sterilizing immunity, i.e. that it, it, it stops you for, from all time from having COVID. Um, but maybe it might for a short-lived uh, period, a bit like um, the influenza vaccines that we have been talking about, where you need uh, maybe an annual jab or a booster. Um, what are your thoughts on vaccines? Yes, okay. So the reason why we have the annual flu vaccine, uh, the seasonal influenza vaccine, is because the seasonal influenza virus expresses different proteins every year. So these are the H and the N, the hemagglutinin and the neuroamidase. These are the proteins against which we make the seasonal influenza vaccine. There's about nine or so different uh, types of H proteins and uh, 12 or so N proteins against which they keep on changing every year. So we make the vaccine against them. Now then, coronavirus vaccine a completely different cup of tea, completely. So we know the, the target protein, that's the protein that latches on to the ACE receptor in humans. So this is the ACE receptor in humans and the protein comes and it makes beautiful fit and then it infects you. So we will be making protein, vaccines against that protein, maybe other proteins as well. The problem is immune memory. For some reason, the beta cells don't seem to make memory against a coronavirus protein. There will be clever people out there working on uh, tricking the human body into making memory against a coronavirus protein. And that will be a marvelous breakthrough if we succeed. My advice is don't put all your eggs in the vaccine basket because we may never make one. 
So remember, with HIV virus, we never made a vaccine. Um, so let us see. Um, only time will tell. I think that's a salutary message. I think uh, we should uh, definitely plan to live with COVID. And if we get a vaccine, clearly that will be upside, if you like, uh, and, uh, and a bonus. But we shouldn't certainly plan on that basis. So finally, I wanted to end on the importance of public trust in, in health messaging. Uh, and, you know, if nothing else, the, the last several months have demonstrated how crucial it is to take timely decisions and action when it comes to public health, but also to communicate things in a clear uh, fashion. And sometimes I think we have suffered from mixed messaging and whether that's on sort of two meters versus one meter, face coverings are mandatory or not, work from home or go to work, uh, use of public transport, which is a new uh, emerging theme um, that is coming up. And sometimes the complexity of messaging. So I certainly um, get a lot of, of questions, even from my own family about, you know, what, what is all of this stuff about bubbles and who can meet indoors and outdoors? Um, it's a complex web. What is your um, feeling about having guidance versus rules versus making these legal? Can we, can we um, legalize common sense? <laughs> yeah, so I learned something very important from my dear friend. He is still a professor at Imperial University. And uh, my friend Azim said to me when I asked him, how do you write all these papers? He said, keep it simple, say it as it is. So Professor Azim Majid, I salute you. you. You taught me something really important. And, and the important bit is keep it simple. So our messages should be succinct, simple and understandable. And it has to be consistent. We cannot have our chief medical officer saying between the lines, be careful, the virus has not gone away. And then we have our ministers and prime minister saying, go out and have a drink in the pub. I think the message from the prime minister should be something like this. I know you're going to go to the pub, but first and foremost, be careful, be very careful, be very, very careful if you're going to go out and have a drink in the pub. It's that order of say it, but mean it and be succinct, be simple, be straightforward, be consistent. But overall, bottom line, uh, communication skills are very important. Keep the message simple. So here in the West, the Southwest, where I gave weekly broadcasts on BBC Radio, BBC Points West television, I developed a strap line, which was keep away from human. And that was so successful, you know, easy to understand, easy to, uh, to remember, keep away from humans. We need those messages repeated consistently. Sorry, Bunkanya, that is, um, as ever, in your own style, a, a great way uh, to end. I totally agree with you that, uh, in a way, greater health confidence will boost economic prospects, and they're not a simple uh, trade-off. Um, as always, it's been a, a pleasure interacting with you. Uh, I'm truly grateful for your clear and comprehensive answers to a very wide range of themes and questions. Uh, whilst um, we have discovered a fair amount about COVID, we are still learning more on a daily basis about dealing with this health emergency. So I'm sure we will continue to call on your expertise. Thank you once again for everything you do. And as someone who believes in the power of human resilience and ingenuity, I'm confident that ultimately we will emerge from this crisis stronger and wiser. Uh, so until the next time, namaste and please keep well. Thank you. And uh, if you wish to follow me, then uh, I put as much updates as I do on my Twitter handle, which is at Dr. Saib, D-O-C-T-O-R-S-H-A-I-B. 
come and join me come and do the journey with me uh it will be good take care namaste thank you namaste and thank you so much to both of you um for such an informative session the last hour has flown by where in fact it's been over an hour and through social media and other ways there's been lots of positive feedback one to lord gadia for some very succinct themes and we went through a whole journey from infection control to how to manage as, as the public so jizesh thank you i'm sure i'm sure you've had some bbc radio 4 training i'm sure in there as well uh, although you didn't grill anyone but uh, you did really well so thank you so much for coming back on and uh you know real words of of gratitude to dr pankanya your clarity your expertise uh, and sharing those messages um and the human side of you your your the cooking you're doing you you shared about your love for the planet as well not to trap you know all those things so we've really enjoyed this last hour myself as well even being a medic uh, having learned so much and um being a gp I actually sat in my room uh, currently in my consulting room uh, having done some video consults and uh, yeah we're preparing ourselves also for the flu uh, for the flu campaign so those of you please do come for your flu vaccination if gps around the country a planning of how we might do that in a safe way but we covered so much there've been some burning questions i know it's it is actually 4:30 we have lord uh, rami ranger with us uh, lord ranger i can see you there um please do bear with us just for a minute or two one question that's been coming through so welcome you can see lord ranger there on your screens who's going to be our next speaker literally in a minute or two uh, one question did come through about antibody testing a lot of people have been asking um there are a lot of uh you know farm very various places that are offering antibody testing and what your view on it because even as people come to me and say dear doctor shall i go for an antibody test uh, very quickly what what your thoughts were about that so antibody test is best done with taking a blood sample rather than a capillary sample in other words you take a um a volume of blood rather than a finger prick okay that's a more precise result second thing only thing that an antibody test tells you is you have survived a coronavirus covid2 infection that is all it tells you that you've had an infection whether you knew about it or did not know about it and no more no less um it doesn't tell you that 6 months down the road you're going to be immune or not that we don't know exactly and i think that's that's the key message mm -hmm. to others as well um about that and another thing which um it's actually think comes in quite nicely what lord range is going to come across which is the economy and lord gadia might bring you in as well this theme of encouraging the economy people to go out and go back into shops get everything going uh, eat out to help out and all these things are going on as well um so we've got this mixed balance between trying to get our economy going support local businesses and at the same time trying to keep ourselves selves safe and it's a real juxtaposition we find you know the government trying to encourage us as well and i don't know if you've got any thoughts on we want to you know boost the economy but at the same time we also that there is you know uh, understandable fear and um you know lack of confidence there is a balancing act but as i said uh i think some of my concluding remarks um we should be careful about a sort of a, a, a false trade off a false binary if i can put it that way um improving public health uh actually will help our economic prospects and uh, dr pankania uh, referred to the uh, example of new zealand right in new zealand you can see that new zealand is booming <laughs> because they've got this uh you know uh pandemic under total control now obviously there is a risk and they've had to face the risk of uh, people traveling into the country and bringing it in but they have now a very you know, strict regime and and method of being able to address that and um so really what i would say is that you know there is a uh, we we can manage health and the economy together and we've got to do it together and in lockstep if we want to get the best results excellent thank thank you uh, lord gadia and dr pankani again in a moment i'm going to actually welcome uh, one of the a key member of the healing earth team which is uh, nitin palan who was actually on earlier who's 
come back on. So Nitin Bhai, I can see you're online in a moment. Just actually, I know you've got a connection with both of these speakers and to, and to thank them as well. So I can see you online. Please do just uh, also just share your thoughts. Could not thank you guys enough. So clear, so succinct. What we learned in the last four months, we learned in an hour and a half. So thanks very much indeed. This hour and a quarter should go viral to every human person on this planet Earth. This is more clear than what ministers talk about, wise men talk about. And, and, and I'm not saying this because I love you both dearly. This was really highly professional. Thank you very much. Thank you. So be ready. I think uh, those of you who are watching at home uh, that this particular, I think all sessions have been really good. So don't uh, 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 you know, single out anyone or, or <coughs> particularly good. And um, we will, I think we'll see a clip of this certainly being shared, you know, uh, on websites, etc. So those of you who are watching at home, please do tell people to still go on, go on to Healing Our Earth. You can, you can watch it from the beginning. Do rewind back an hour and a quarter and, and watch this session. So, um, so with that, uh, a big thank you to Dr. Pankanya and Lord Gadia. Dr. Pankanya, I think I'm going to come around and sample some of your Gujarati dishes. Thank you very much and uh, see what's on offer. Um, I've tr I, I tried to say stay away from humans, but my, my, my spouse wasn't having any of it. So. I, I, I've been, um, I was treated to a fabulous uh, lunch by uh, Dr. Pankanya and his wonderful wife when I visited his home in uh, March. Uh, so it's well worth doing, Milan. Good, good. Well, I, did, I hope you picked up the recipes. Also. I'll, just, I'll come around to you instead and uh, try from you. We welcome everyone. We are a proper Indian and we welcome everyone. Good. Well, uh, thanks to both of you. So, so we carry on. So those of you are watching at home, I really enjoyed that session. Being, in, you know, even from a medical background, I've picked up so much. Um, as doctors, we're, we're talking all the time and sharing things, but it was really nicely done. So uh, I'm sure those of you at home really enjoyed that session. And there was a really nice chemistry between, between the two of them and a real clarity of, uh, of sessions, but we, we carry on. So do look on uh, healingourearth.com. 